Question, Grace. Um, uh, I was intrigued by the multiple stool sample. Our hospital switched to uh, yeah. CT yeah. and PCR, and they, we've been told mm -hmm. that you're only allowed to send one sample. You can't send. So what do you, how do you think one sample is enough? I know the, the, some of the new approaches to improve diagnosis, I don't know what to tell you in that regard because they're, they're still too new at this point for us to have a and clear sense. Actually, we've seen cases of the PCR saying it depends on the quality of sample, timing, and with IV stations, I would like to know So, again, there's way too many questions at this point. So, question in the back. Um, the excellent questions that I don't have wonderful answers to. Um, we are aggressive with anti-C diff therapy in someone who's high risk, someone who's had a prior infection, someone who is, you know, the newborn is at home. I mean, that's a setting which is the classic setting for this to show up. So that's, and, and the other thing is healthcare providers. We take care of a lot of people who are nurses, people who are working in the hospital setting, which is an ultra high risk environment. And, um, um, we will be very aggressive in that setting. The, the problem with two weeks of vancomycin is that the recurrence rates are incredibly high. So sometimes we'll extend the course to a full month. And we're really dealing, I think the IBD patients are a very unique group that we have to think about because there is so much at risk in this population. I mean, the mortality rate is higher. These are people who are at risk of dying. Um, the risk of colectomy is markedly increased in these individuals compared to the general population. So and, and again, the synergy with the IBD flare is the, the key problem. So we really have to get this under control as fast as possible. If we miss the diagnosis, our assays are not working properly to make the call, patients are going to do poorly. And that's basically where we were back in 2004. Um, so there's no, there's no good, easy answer that I can give you other than what we've been trying to track in our own population. So we will use vancomycin for extended time periods in these patients. Um, if we want to taper antibiotics, we've oftentimes resorted to rifaximin tapers. Um, oftentimes you have to ramp up treatment. And I can tell you that some of the patients we can get through this hospitalization, they never fully recover. They don't go back to their previous state of health. Um, we published a paper uh, a couple of years ago looking at permanent work disability in Crohn's disease patients. And on the multivariate logistic regression, we actually found that having a history of C. difficile predicted work disability. We took it out of the paper because we didn't think people would believe it. We actually removed that data from the paper. But I, in, this, in this population, I think it's probably true that there are some people who basically their, their disease accelerates and they never can recover from it. They never get better fully. So, and I don't, I, I wish I could understand that better at this point, but um, it's been a major challenge. Question? I was curious, <clears throat> excuse me, how compelling the evidence was for um, less issues with C. diff in so there's a paper that's going to be published um, in inflammatory bowel diseases, which is a study that came from uh, the ECHO, the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization. So there was an attempt to actually look at uh, a series of tertiary referral centers, and there was retrospective data that was being pooled from these various IBD centers scattered throughout, I think, Israel and Europe. And they saw an association with immunosuppression. Um, I don't know how anti-TNFs are used in a lot of these other countries. So I think episodic dosing is much more common. Um, so I'm not quite sure if we can extrapolate uh, some of these things because we use maintenance anti-TNFs in the US much more commonly than we would be found in other countries. Um, so we did not see it. Um, a lot of the data is going to be lacking because the administrative data sets don't give us the background outpatient information in these patients. So we're sort of waiting for other centers to kind of pool their experience and hear about this. So it's, it's a really limited data set that we can turn to at this point. Question. None of the patients that we took care of died, which was quite fortunate. The mean age was approximately 40. Um, 
I have heard of young patients dying from C. difficile related IBD problems. And again, it's a sort of spiral into the surgical ICU where there are infections and clots and sort of that downward progression where things just progressively get worse, get worse, get worse. And, um, um, and, and that's basically what happens in the C. difficile cohort in the general population. So it's, it's the additive effect of complication upon complication that ultimately leads to the mortality. Question. Um, to your knowledge, are there any studies on topical administration of uh, probiotics in pouchitis um, with severe or animus, any animal form? So the issue of probiotics and pouchitis is, again, a little bit murky to begin with. So we had fantastic data that showed up in 2000 from an Italian trial with VSL3 that suggested it was a wonderful strategy for pouch patients. It's been difficult to replicate that data. Um, and there's some sense that um, some of the probiotics that have been effective may not always be effective in these settings. Um, in the setting of C. difficile, I think there's no data at this point in terms of how to handle the, these individuals with pouch infections. So again, basically the, the major centers that do the pouch reconstruction procedures, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, probably have the best data sets because of their volumes at this point. And I haven't seen a publication yet. Dr. Riss. Dr. Lamont had mentioned that he posted about IgA levels in mice. Uh, he increased the cyclomycin velarity. Mm -hmm. There was a randomized trial on cyclomycin velarity preventing the recurrence. Mm -hmm. And it was efficacious post in Lancet. So in the population of patients with C. diff and bad IBD, do you try to avoid cyclomycin because of the fear? Of no, actually, we've IBD. used it. I, I apologize for not making that point clear. We've actually used Saccharomyces boulardii in the IBD population with some success. So we've had some individuals who really struggled and we were able to sort of get them to some resolution and have them finally heal because and they've maintained. Of, of, uh, so you have to be, obviously be very careful with the use of um, probiotic agents in hospitalized patients, but in the outpatient setting I think that's actually where you're going to have much more success and it's probably going to be a better um, adverse reaction profile. But I agree with you that in ICU patients, hospitalized patients, we have to be conservative.